Welcome to Taiwan is Helping on ICRT, the program where we discuss how Taiwan is assisting other countries, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. ICRT. I'm Ryan Drillsma, and today I'm joined by Mary claude Peltschert, who is the International Affairs Manager of the Sunshine Social Welfare Foundation. Marie, how are you doing? Hi, hi, I'm fine. How are you? I'm great, thank you. So Marie, can you tell us what the Sunshine Social Welfare Foundation is and what it does? Okay, so we're a, a foundation uh, based in Taiwan and we were established in 1981. And uh, we work with burn survivors, oral cancer survivors, and people who have different forms of facial disfigurement and our services uh, are on two fronts. First, we provide direct uh, services to our clients, uh, which include physical and psych psychosocial rehabilitation. Uh, and then the other front is more on the social aspect of uh, how to prevent burns, how to prevent oral cancer, and also how to raise awareness about um, what we call face equality, which is that we're trying to uh, break the stereotypes or the prejudice that uh, affect people who have a different appearance. How do you address the social side of these issues? Uh, well, we when we do those prevention activities, for example, in schools or in the communities, uh, we always include a component of what we call face equality. Mm -hmm. So we explain, for example, what are burns, how to avoid burns, but then we will also talk about the plight of burn survivors after their injury and the difficulty of rehabilitation, but the biggest difficulty actually is returning back to society and having to face okay. uh, questions or stares. So we're trying to raise awareness uh, of the public about how to not judge people by their appearance. Yeah. What are some of the responses you've had from the children like? Well, uh, the children are actually very, very responsive. And uh, we try to summarize the message in a very simple way so that they can understand. Yeah. So in, in Chinese, we say, uh, 不一样, then so, although okay. you look different, but we're all great. Right. So really the children are very, very responsive to that and they, they catch very quickly the message. But the difficulty is with more ingrained uh, stereotypes that people have that sometimes we don't really realize that we have. So how to make people aware of that so that they can, you know, maybe check themselves. Yeah. Okay. As well as your work in Taiwan, I believe you've partnered with organizations in several Latin American countries over the years. Uh, could you talk about some of the different countries that you've worked with? Yes, um, because I'm responsible for our international projects. And uh, okay. these projects mostly focus on training and capacity building. And uh, our focus is on improving the level of burn rehabilitation care in other countries. And one of our focus has been, like you said, Latin America. And so far, uh, well, actually since 2011, uh, we began working in Nicaragua with an organization there to organize trainings for burn professionals. And uh, from the start, these trainings were envisioned as regional projects because um, they share common language, common cu cu culture, and also these countries are all very close to one another. Okay. So our projects, uh, Although they were held in Nicaragua, they also include Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, Panama, and eventually we expanded to South America to include Peru, Colombia, and also Mexico. Yeah. Why have these countries needed help from Taiwan? What is the medical knowledge or expertise that they perhaps lack that Taiwan can offer? Um, actually, what we found in Latin America is that they already have a strong regional network of professionals working in burns. Mm -hmm. And also these professionals are very dedicated. You know, some of them have been working in burns for many, many years. And they also have very good multidisciplinary teams in place, which means that apart from in the hospital, you have the surgeon during the surgery, they also have therapists that are within the team that can provide good rehabilitation service to burn patients. But what we found is that these therapists, they do a lot, but they often lack formal burn training because basically I don't think there's any place really in the world where you can learn about burns in a comprehensive way when you're training as a therapist. Right. So they often don't have enough knowledge or the theor theoretical tools to base their clinical practice on so that they do things, but probably it's not necessarily the most efficient way of doing things. Yeah. 
So they, uh, we, we're trying to uh, improve their clinical reasoning by bringing them more knowledge and better practice. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example. For example, hmm. uh, we've once met a therapist working with a, a burn patient who had a burn on the neck here, then yes. the scar was contracting. So we asked the therapist, oh, what do you do to treat this? And she said, oh, we do stretching exercise. And then we asked, well, what kind of stretching exercise do you do? And she says, oh, we stretch like this. And the problem is that the scar is here. <laughs> you have to stretch your neck backwards. So these are kind of things that they do stretching, but they don't necessarily do it the right way. <laughs> yeah. So it's so about are... fine tuning the details. Yeah, that's that's it. You know, they have the, the basic concepts, but sometimes it's just how to identify the correct problem and its correct cause and then decide on the correct intervention to treat that. Because otherwise, they're doing many things, but in the end, the outcome of the patient uh, is not as, how do you say, it's not as uh, good as you could, you could expect. It's you know, not as effective would... as it could be. Yeah, and... And the problem that they have in these countries is that they see many patients and these patients oftentimes come from very remote areas and mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of time to work with them. So if you have a very limited amount of time to work with the patient, you have to be very, very precise right. on what you're going to do and what you're going to give them. So this is something that we're trying to help them with because you know the basics uh, and also the motivation is, is all there. So it's just like you said, just fine tuning some things. Yeah. <laughs> So I saw that two of the major projects that you've worked on in Nicaragua and Latin America are the hand handburn project and yeah. pressure garment fabrication. Could you tell us what pressure garment fabrication is? Okay. So after a burn, uh, the skin is going to heal yeah. and scars are going to develop. And the problem with burn scars is that first they contract. So you're going to end up with, for example, deformities. Yeah. And the other thing is that the scars are going to grow become very thick and burn survivors need to wear pressure garments which are made with nylon material and it's very tight and the garment provides pressure to to press on the scar so to control the growth and the countries we work with um, they were all doing pressure garments but they all kind of like developed the system to make the garments themselves like they looked at garments and then they uh, unstitched them and then they tried to replicate the, the the how to make them but it's really kind of like um a DIY method okay and so what we did was that we provided a training a very structured training to explain to them how to correctly measure how to correctly make patterns and then how to correctly sew the garments like a kind of like a, an SOP okay so that the the garments are uh, better fitting and also they're tri-dimensional which yeah. means they're more comfortable and the other, uh, other important aspect is that how to adjust the pressure because uh, not every burn patient requires the same amount of pressure. So that was very, very technical. <laughs> yeah. Is this an ongoing project or something that you did in the past where you've kind of instituted, you've helped institute a system and now people can produce uh, garments better there on their own? The training took place from 2011 to 2014. Yeah. And the countries that took part, well, the seamstress and the therapist, they went back to their organization and they implemented the techniques. And last year we did um, an assessment to see, okay, after four years, what what's the status of the, 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 the techniques that they have? And yeah. we've identified uh, skills that are still lacking or gaps that, you know, things need to be addressed. Okay. And so this year we developed an advanced training to address the problems that we uh, identified last year during the assessment. Okay. What were some of the problems? Uh, well, like sometimes it's really small details, but they make a big difference. For example, yeah. measurement, just making sure that um, you're measuring the correct anatomical points or making sure that the patient has the correct posture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also some uh, sewing problems, like for example, that make putting the pieces together in a certain order or sewing in a certain way will affect the outcome of the garment. So they're very, very small details, but once like during the whole process, if all of these small details accumulate at the end, the garment is probably not, 
you know, the most efficient garment. So we try to to address that. So the the other big project is the hand burn project. Is mm. is hand burning a big issue in Latin America? Yes, because a lot of their burn patients are small children. Okay. And small children, you know, when they play around and, you know, they get they easily get burned on their hands. Right. And in Latin America, especially at this season during Christmas time, uh, they use a lot of fireworks. And a okay. lot of children get hand burns playing with fireworks. And But the hand issue in burns is very complex because the hand is a very complex structure. So how to deal with... Uh, burn hand contractures and everything you need to go back to the basics like with hand anatomy and and so on so we did a three-year program to basically the first year was to instill them like the correct knowledge basis okay and then um, in the second and third year we focus more on how to evaluate hand problems like the correct process the correct thinking process to evaluate hand problems yeah are there any joint projects? So uh, what I'm saying is that our uh, training projects like this are usually long term because um, you cannot achieve a good learning impact if you only have like five days of training and that's it. You know, right. we and also we need to do a lot of follow up to make sure that what they learned in the first year has yeah. been applied and then we can move on in the second year to something different. Yeah. So is this also a project that you're going back to follow up on as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Has the pandemic made your job more difficult this year? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> we had a lot of um, conferences that we were supposed to attend and we couldn't go. And we also had this uh, the advanced uh, training program on pressure garment. We were supposed to do one part online and one part in classroom in Nicaragua. Uh -huh. And obviously we couldn't go. Right. So the whole training program was done 100% online. So okay. we had to make online courses for, for the seamstresses and the therapists in Spanish. <laughs> yeah. You talked before a bit about how you deal with the social aspect of burns in Taiwan. Is this something you also put into your work in Latin America? At this point now, not, not yet because uh, a lot of the, the interest uh, in our trainings is mostly for uh, physical rehabilitation. Right. But we know for a fact that there's need for uh, psychosocial rehabilitation training in Latin America. It's just that it's a bit more complex because psychosocial issues are going to be affected by many, many different social cultural factors. Right. It's not like, for example, if you're dealing with the hen, it doesn't matter which country you are, it's the same principle. But mm. if you're dealing with uh, issues arising post-burn, like trauma or body image issues, these are going to be affected by the, the place where you are and okay. the culture you are in. So this is a bit more difficult, but yes, it's going to be something that probably in the future we might further explore. And also, I think that our partners are interested in that. Yeah. Um, how's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs helped you with your work? Well, Obviously, the biggest support that MOFA has given us is funding our projects because it's not easy to find funding in Taiwan for international projects. So yeah. MOFA at this point is, is really a big help. And the other thing is that um, when we go, for example, in these countries, mm -hmm. they also provide a lot of support on site. Now, obviously, our project is very simple. It's just like simple training. It's not like we're going to do any agricultural project or community building project. But basically what they help us with is that they, uh, through their own network in the country, they can mm -hmm. raise awareness about the, the project and bring awareness about how Taiwan or how Sunshine is helping in the country. Okay. And, and also we found that sometimes, uh, af even after project has ended, they continue to support the local organizations, right. uh, for example, for prevention projects or so on. So so it's kind of like um, a cycle. Okay, that's great. Um, have you learned anything from organizations or doing your work in Latin America that you've been able to bring back and utilize in Taiwan? Yes, actually, uh, it's quite interesting that um, although we go there and we teach them, but during the same process, we're also learning because our therapists are very senior yeah. and they're, they're, they're like internalized all of this knowledge very naturally. So now how to make this uh, tacit or implicit knowledge become more explicit, more concrete. This is like a learning process for us as well. Okay. So 
basically what we see is that when we do these training, we have to prepare, we have to organize our knowledge. And in that process, we're kind of re-examining what we do. And it's kind of like a feedback loop because when we do a project in another country, sometimes we the training that we did in that country, we bring it back and we can do the training for our own therapist. Or the training that we do for our own therapist, we we transpose it to Latin America. So it's always kind of like a everything goes back to 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 yeah. It's kind of like a feedback loop. Okay. <laughs> Um, so finally, what are the Sunshine Social Welfare Foundation's plans for the near future? Well, we're going to continue further developing online training. Yeah. Um, we started planning actually in 2018. And uh, last year we had kind of like a test run. And this year, well, we were forced to, you know, <laughs> use it more. And it's something that uh, whether or not there's a pandemic is something that we're going to continue to do because uh, online training uh, can overcome a lot of our obstacles, obviously distance, language, funding, and so on. Yeah. But it's also a good tool that can complement classroom training. And so next year, what we want to do is that um, uh, we want to roll out a full online training program on hand rehabilitation for okay. in Latin America. And we're aiming to reach for maybe 50 participants. Yeah. Okay. Because training that, the classroom training that we did, we could only accommodate 10 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now we want to expand to more people. So next year is going to be another level of yeah, another level of testing our online training for for an international audience. Right. So it's an ever expanding operation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for speaking to me today. It's been a pleasure, and I wish you all the best with your organization in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you.